Hi everybody! Welcome to the very first video of my channel about data science. The idea of this first series of videos is to introduce some important statistic topics, like hypothesis testing and confidence interval, which are always present in data analysis. Before exploring them, we need to be sure to have clear in mind some basic concepts of probability. So let us refresh them in the next slides. So guys, the starting point when we want to speak about a probabilistic model is a random phenomenon. This is a process where we don't know the outcome a priori. For example, when we throw a coin, we don't know if we will get a head or a tail. Similarly, when we throw a dice, we cannot predict the number we will get. More in general, we can also think as a random phenomenon the height of a person in Spain. Indeed, we can think about the experiment of measuring a random person in Spain. Also in this case, we would not know a priori the measure we will get. After we are sure we are observing a random phenomenon, we need a way to describe it mathematically. The first thing to do is to describe all the possible outcomes of our process. We can represent them in an intuitive way, using letters or numbers. The set containing all the outcomes is called sample space, and we will indicate it with the letter omega. In the example of the coin, we could use the letter t for the tails and the h for the heads. For the dice, we can use the integers between 1 and 6, and for the heights, the real numbers. But we are free to use the notation you want. Now guys, before defining a probability on our experiment, we need to pay attention to the size of omega. Indeed, there are two different theories to do this, depending on the size of our sample space. Let's start with a simple and intuitive one. That is when the elements of omega are just a finite number or at maximum are as many as the natural numbers. In this case, we are going to construct a discrete probability model. If we think about the previous example, the experiment of the coin and the dice belong to this category. If you consider as a random phenomenon how many calls a call center receives in one hour, we could use the natural numbers to represent the outcome. We still are in the discrete case. However, if we represent the height of a person with a positive real number, the sample space is too big. Indeed, any real number intervals contains more elements than the natural numbers. Notice that in the real life, you are not always interested in guessing a specific outcome, but sometimes you want to predict a more general result. Can be something like, with the dice I'm going to get a number smaller than 5. The call center is going to receive more than 200 calls. All these kind of affirmations are called events and naturally can be represented with a subset of omega, which contains all the outcomes that would make this event happen. In the previous example with the dice, it would be the set containing the number 1, 2, 3, 4. For the call center, the subset with the natural numbers bigger than 200. Now, for all these events, that is every possible subset of omega, we want to define a probability. That is a measure of how confident we are that this event will happen. So guys, what is the probability? Probability is a function which assigns to every subset of omega, that is what we call an event, a number between 0 and 1. One interpretation is that it is the percentage of the number of times that the event would occur when we repeat the experiment a huge amount of times. In the case of the coin, when we say that the probability of the head is 0.5, we expect that if we throw the coin thousands of times, the percentage of heads would be near 50%. This probability should satisfy some properties, which are intuitive if we think this as percentage. The probability that one of two disjoint events will occur is the sum of the probability of the single event. The probability of omega is 1, Indeed, we always obtain a result which is inside omega. Often, given experiment, we don't want to work with omega, which is a formula representation of the outcomes of the experiment, but we want to work with numbers, which are measures coming from our experiment. 
to be able to manipulate them easily and perform mathematical operations. For this reason, now we are going to introduce the notion of real random variable, which is every function which goes from omega to the real number. We call key the values that our random variable can take. This gives us a lot of freedom. We can define omega once, but then we can take every function we need for our calculations. For the example of the coin, we could use a function that maps the outcome of head to 1 and tail to 0. For the dice, we could consider the function which maps the event of obtaining a number to the square of the number. It is natural that the random variable will also inherit a probability. Given a real random variable, we can define a function called the probability mass function. For every value that my random variable can assume, we define f of x to be the sum of the probability of all outcomes whose image through my random variable are equal to the small x. Similarly to the case of the events, this tells us how much we are likely to observe this quantity that derives from our experiment. In the example of the coin, we have that key is equal to 0 and 1, and if we indicate with p the probability of getting a head, we have that the mass function can be written as the formula in the slide. Indeed, f of 1 is equal to p, and f of 0 is equal to 1 minus p. From now on, we can forget about the sample space, and just work with the random variables with their probability mass function and key, which will be called sample space. Another important concept to introduce is the cumulative distribution function. The reason will be clear in the next slides. For every x in R, we define f of x to be the probability that my random variable will get a value which is less than x. If I cannot obtain something less than x, I will put 0. So, in the example of the dice, where the random variable is simply the identity, we obtain the function you can see in the image. If x is smaller than 1, it's 0, because we cannot obtain with the dice a number smaller than 1. If I consider a number bigger than 6, then f of x is 1, because I always obtain a number which is smaller than 6. Now we are ready to tackle the case when omega is big, like an interval of the real numbers. If we are in this case, like the example of the height of a person, we cannot assign a probability to every single number, because there are too many. We have to consider just some subset of omega and define the probability just for these events, not for the single outcome. In the case of the real number, it is natural to consider the intervals and all the possible unions and intersections between them. So we want to construct a function that assigns to every interval a number between 0 and 1, which describes how confident we are that the outcome of the experiment is in that interval. This will be our probability. Again, we will have the notion of random variable, that is a function from R to R, which sends intervals to intervals, like the continuous functions. Now, let's look at a practical example in order to check that what I said makes sense. We consider the following experiment. I have a metal bar and I ask you to indicate a point on the bar. The outcome of this experiment is the point that you indicate, and as random variable, that is a measure coming from the experiment, I will consider the distance between the point and the beginning of the bar. This is a real number between 0 and the length L of the bar. We want to say something about the probability of this variable. We suppose that all the points have the same chance to be chosen. Now we have to define a probability on the intervals of real numbers, which in this case can be identified as intervals on the bar. The probability we will define indicates how confident we are that the chosen point will be in that interval. Of course, intervals of the same size have the same chance to contain the chosen point, so the same probability. Bigger intervals will have a higher chance to contain the outcome of the experiment. So a natural choice would be to define as a probability of an interval i to be the ratio of its length and the length of the bar. It is between 0 and 1 and satisfies all the nice properties we want. 
Let us see how we can write this in a mathematical way. In the case of the continuous random variables, in order to describe the probability that is defined on the intervals, we consider the cumulative distribution function. That like in the discrete case, for every x in R, it is the probability that my random variable is less than x, so the anti-image of the interval minus infinity x. We ask this function to be continuous, and from this came the name continuous random variable. After this, we define the probability density function to be the positive function such that when I integrate this between minus infinity and the number t, we obtain the cumulative distribution function calculated in t. It is the analogous of the probability mass function that we have defined in the discrete case. With the example of before, considering a bar of length 2, the cumulative distribution function will be 0 if x is less than 0, 1 if x is greater than 2, and x over 2 if x is between 0 and 2. The density is obtained simply calculating the derivative. Let's introduce the concept of mean. Do you remember that at the school you were calculating the arithmetic mean of your grades in order to know how you were doing? Well, this can be seen as a sum where we are summing all the different grades you had get, multiplied by the percentage of time you got them. We do something similar for a random variable in the discrete case. We sum all the values in the sample space, multiplied by the probability of getting them as you can see on the slide. In the continuous case, we find a similar formula, where we have substituted the sum with the integral, and the mass function with the density function. So guys, the last concept of today is the variance. This measure tells us how the values are spread around the mean. It is very important information, because it tells us if we are likely to get a number around the mean or we could find something way bigger or smaller. In the discrete case, we consider for every point the square distance from the mean. Then we calculate the mean of this new quantity. So we find the sum that you can see on the slide. Here you can see some useful reformulation of the same quantity. In the case of the continuous random variable, we replicate the same idea, but using the integral and the density function instead. This is all for the video of today. Hope you managed to follow me until this point. Let's quickly sum up what we have learned. First, we have seen how is described a random experiment in a formal way, through the notions of random phenomenon, sample space, events, and probability. When we have all these elements, we say that we have a probability model for our event. In the second part of the video, we have introduced fundamental notions in order to work with numeric values coming from the experiment. We have introduced the concept of random variable, cumulative distribution function, probability mass function and probability density function, and we have concluded with the mean and variance. So thank you a lot to have spent this time with me. Let me know what do you think about the video and what you would like to see next. Don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe to the channel.